So my name is Helen Lazowski and I'm going to be talking um, about stories um, and the importance of stories, how important they are for collaboration, how important they are um, to explain and understand concepts for humans and as glue to hold us together. Okay, so you probably have already heard people say that humans are hardwired for stories and it's true it's not just filmmakers and authors that need to be able to tell a really great story right we also need to be able to listen and and understand that the telling of great stories in itself is a gift so every leader needs to be able to inspire their followers every executive needs to be able to present their vision compellingly to their staff. You've got salespeople need to be able to pitch their brilliant products. Um, and you need uh, call centre staff to be able to listen to the stories that the customers are saying about, so that they can help. Otherwise, without that understanding, they can't help at all. So, stories are, in fact, the way that we share knowledge, and they're that currency of knowledge sharing. A well-told story is of absolutely great value. So, when I was writing this talk, it turns out the earliest reference to a story I could find was 28,000 years ago, which I think means it predates us being Homo sapiens. So, I think that's quite cool, actually. So, stories have been around for more than us, almost. And you'll see that stories have changed. We used to record our stories, painting them onto walls, carving them into rock. We started telling them around campfires, and we still have a lot of that in our, built into the way in which we think. Um, more recently, with the printing press, we've got books and we've got comic books. And of course, stories have evolved now so that when you're looking at gaming stories, you've got multiple threads and you get to choose the path of that story, which is really cool. So I'm going to talk to you about three different types of story. Um, we're going to talk about stories where we're talking about other people. We tell stories about other people mostly. That's most of the kind of stories we talk about. There are stories that we talk about about ourselves as a tribe, and then there's stories we tell about ourselves as individuals. So, the first thing I'm going to do is actually tell you a story, but I'm going to do a really condensed version. <laughs> So this is the story of Stone Soup, and I'm not sure if any of you will know this. It's a, quite a well-known story in many cultures. So the story goes that uh, in the days that we never define how long ago it was, there was a traveller travelling from across the country and basically stopping village to village, and he came across a village where he was hungry. The first place he came to, he knocked on the door, interrupted a person and said can you spare any food? And the person said, I'm really sorry, we really can't. We've got very little. We've got a few scraps of vegetables to feed my family. And the traveller said, that's fine. I don't want to take from your family. That's okay. I'll try somewhere else. And he moved on. And the story was the same somewhere else. And then again, somewhere else. And instead of just moving through the village and leaving, the traveller whether this was a new idea or he did it at every village, the story doesn't tell us. The traveller stopped in the market square and he persuaded a small boy that he was going to make stone soup. And if the boy would bring him a pot full of water, they would boil up the water and they would make stone soup and the boy could have some of that. Of course, the boy ran home, got his pot, bringing his mother with him, who was like, this does not sound legit, and it doesn't, does it? Um, he made a big fuss of putting a big smooth stone into the pot and they boiled this water and of course whilst this water's boiling word gets around the village and more and more people come including the people who'd said that they didn't have enough to spare but if this guy's making stone soup in the middle of the market square we want to see how this goes right so the traveler is making a big fuss about tasting it every now and again saying this is going to be the most delicious thing really amping it up and then he stops and he says do you know what would make this really really good is if I could just add a few carrots, because that, I've had some stone soup once, add a few carrots and it's amazing. And eventually a chap says, I've got some carrots which I will give you if you feed my entire family with your stone soup when it's ready. And of course that goes fine. No problem at all, says the traveller. This is, this is perfectly okay, I'm happy to do that trade. The next thing we have is, 
onions. Onions would be really good too. I've best soup I ever had had onions in it. We'll just add that. It brings out the flavour of the stone. I don't know. So he, another person says, well, I have some onions, which, are, but I want the same deal as the guy with the carrots, and that's fine. And of course, the traveller manages to get contributions from the whole village. And eventually, everybody gets soup, which is great, right? Now, has, how many of you have heard that story or a version of it? Sometimes it's done with pebbles and nails and, yeah, okay, so some people. So it's often told as a moral story of how this traveller tricked people into giving him, um, feeding him effectively for free. Wasn't he clever? Um, but to me, I look at that story and it talks about how you can illustrate how collaboration works, right? When everybody contributes in, you've got greater than the sum of the parts and everybody benefits. So I also think that this story is a really good way of explaining how it can challenge and influence. So I don't normally talk to my mother. She's a retired primary school teacher. I mean, I talk to her, but I don't normally talk to her about my talks. But I happen to be at her house. And I said, I'm coming. I'm writing this talk. I'm coming to speak. And she said, what are you going to write about? I said, it's interesting. You know the story of the stone soup? I'm telling that. Oh, she said, yeah, we used to tell that to the kids all the time. I wasn't, wasn't that man clever to trick everybody into giving him some food? And he, he got all that lovely meal and all those people contributed. And I said, really, that's the story you're telling ch children? That, that, she says, yeah, well, that's, we've been telling it for years. And I said, well, that's great. But do you not think it would have been better to say, this is how a man brought some joy into a, a group of people who were less joyful, how instead of a meagre meal, everybody got a feast. And there was solid seconds of utter silence while my mum reprocessed several decades of learning. And she went, I had never, ever thought of that before. Isn't it a better story, I told her. Well, yes, but she still has trouble with this. Having given her that viewpoint of the story, it's really clever, she can't unthink it. So, bless her, she can never not know that version of the story. Same story, but with a completely different viewpoint. So, this is what we do when we talk about stories about other people. We can share our understanding. It also helps us learn secondhand, so we don't have to learn from other people's experiences. So this was really useful in the very early days when you wanted to know that the thing with teeth was dangerous and stay away from it without having to experience that firsthand. It makes common sense right. Since we write now, <laughs> uh, we, can project, we can project that out. That learning can last much, much longer. We don't just have to learn from our last generation. We can learn from generations gone past. And we don't have to do anything. The other nice thing here is that learning secondhand means that you can experience emotions such as grief and loss without having to lose something in real life. So you get to experience those emotions and get yourself used to them before you have to deal with them. In many ways, it's a nice practice run for um, not just horrible events, but good events too, right? So we've been telling stories, and most of the stories we talk about other people are things that you would recognise. So we would talk about Harry Potter. We would talk about Avengers Endgame. We might talk about the Ukrainian war. Those are all stories we're telling about other people. And we very much want to use them for good. But this telling stories of other people because of the influence that we can bring with that, we also have to remember that that's how gossip is born. That's also how misinformation and propaganda are born. So the stories that tell, we tell about other people need some kind of reference for are they true, are they not? Are they supposed to be true? Are they not? So fiction is easily recognised when you're talking about Cinderella and Snow White, but it's not necessarily easily recognised when you're reading news online. And that, the influence carries through, which is where this misinformation problem has come about. So, I'm recapping here. <laughs> the Stone Soup story talked about collaboration, but it also talked about facilitation. Um, 
I could use it to influence the way that my, my mother thought about that story, and I could use that as a shortcut to her, for her to experience something else. So, we are influenced by not just movies and fake news and gossip, but by the stories that we've been told. The stories that we tell about tribes, ourselves as, tri as a tribe, should I say, um, I'm going to tell you, in fact, I'm going to tell you another short story <laughs> to illustrate this point. So, this is a story about a guy called Gavin Armstrong. This is a lot less well known. I want to, I'm, I'm hoping that none of you know it, but maybe you do. A guy called Gavin Armstrong, he was living and working in Asia, and he had no electricity and no running water, and a lot of the uh, inhabitants locally had um, anemia or diseases and, and illnesses that were brought on by anemia. And the Red Cross were doing a really great job desperately trying to get iron supplements out to the local population. The problem with that is that lots of the people were very poor and therefore getting supplements out is an expensive thing, even if you're giving them free. You've got to continuously get that supply out because if you stop taking the tablets, they stop working. And lots of these people live in really remote areas, so just the supply lines were really, really difficult too. And this guy, Gavin Armstrong, thought, we can do this better. And he worked out, with a little bit of science, he did do science, um, that if they dropped a little bar of ing ingot of iron into the cooking pot, it gave roughly the right amount of dosage of iron to remove the need for these little tablets. Brilliant. They handed these out. It, supplied, it solved the supply problem because you only have to get it out to the remote areas one time. It solved the cost issues because it wasn't very expensive to do. And it also solved the problem of the fact that the local people needed to keep doing this. But the problem with that is that the same thing with the, with the tablets happened, which is humans are humans and they forgot. And you can't seem to do anything about that. And he could have given up then. But what he did was he think he did work out a way that he could do this. And what he did was he had the little ingots made into these little fish. And the reason he chose the fish shape was because there was an awful lot of local stories, folklore, about this particular fish and how it was really lucky. So having made these iron fish, he gave them out to everybody and was saying, put this in your pot and cook, bring luck into your family. And it really quickly became a habit that people did because they were so used to the weight of the story from hi their history and their childhood about these lucky fish that they were putting it into their pot. Really, really solved the problem really well. It solved it so well that, in fact, tourists were then coming to the area and wanting to take the fish home. So they now fund the outreach for the locals by selling fish to the tourists because the, the tourists recognise the fish as a local thing. So, the success of that is largely built on him recognising that he could pick out the weight of a story that already existed and turn that to his own benefit. And it became part of the culture. So, who here did know that story? Oh, okay, good. Not many. So, by telling you that story, I have managed to bind us very, very loosely <laughs> as a tribe. We can now tell a story about the fact that we all shared this little tiny experience. Now, it's not a very strong bond, to be perfectly honest. As a tribe, it's rubbish. But if we amped up the emotions that we were feeling, perhaps made it a little more exciting, that bond becomes stronger. And we keep telling those stories. It would become more stronger. So apparently it's not right to terrify your team on a regular basis, Geneva Convention or something. But what you can do is maybe do something really interesting that that brings out those emotions. So the more emotions that are in it, the more tightly you'll be bonded together because you will keep retelling that story. So when you hear of these really extreme uh, sports things that sometimes they send executives on, 
it's not the fact that you're doing these extreme sports and overcoming your fears that make that a really good team event. It's the fact that you were all terrified and you will keep telling that story over and over again. And by telling that story, that's that tribal formation. Now, that's also how cults can start. So, you know, <laughs> everything, there's a downside to everything. <laughs> so the other thing to mention there is that it's also... It's about who controls that narrative. So if anybody has come across, is anybody aware of the story that's happening at the moment with sort of Disney versus the state of Florida? They're really, really strongly trying to control who tells the story because who tells the story is winning the war of, who, of what gets told, okay? So like my mother had one version of the story and I had another, that's actually happening in real life. So... We share experiences um, to help build teams because of the stories that get retold. And the stronger the emotions that we experience, the stronger the stories become and the stronger that bond becomes. And old and familiar stories come with the weight of history behind them. And you can build on that and use those stories again if you can find a way of doing it. So, the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves do bind us together and we share experiences so we have shared stories and what we want to do is try and learn a little tiny bit about each other and this is um, basically culture soup in the making because this is how you build a culture in a company or in a family or in a team so you're building stories that tell us who we are as this tribe. This tribe does this. This tribe had this experience. Okay. So, last bit. <laughs> who here? Uh, this is going to be talking about stories we tell about ourselves. This is the hardest thing, um, I think, to do. So who here actually really enjoys networking? See, some people do. M me, really not my favourite thing at all. Um, <laughs> I find it really difficult to tell interesting stories ab about myself, right? That's, that's all the pressure of, I, I, maybe I have a story, but is it interesting? Is anybody going to care? Do they want to know? Um, <laughs> and you've got to do it in a really short amount of time. Um, how do I condense who I am into like one or two sentences? It's terrifying. <laughs> So I'm going to give you some homework about that in a minute, which you don't have to do, but I, my mother's a teacher. It's kind of ingrained into me. Um, when we go networking or when we're, we, we come to an event like this, we're also talking to other people. Obviously, we need to listen to their stories. And it's really interesting with what happens in our brain. This is the really clever bit of networking, which I wish I'd known years ago. So when we listen to someone else tell us about their story, um, we're literally listening to a tiny story and we experience a little bit of an insight into that person, if we're lucky. So our brains are looking for patterns. Um, so when somebody tells you about a story or bad about themselves, our brain spins through every story it can ever remember having been told to see if it can find something that pattern matches that. So you might get... Um, the cunning beggar who tricked people into feeding him, or you might get um, that kind and clever stranger who found a way of bringing a community together. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, how even the story I tell about the story changes what you think. <laughs> a bit meta there. So, your brain is looking for patterns and fragments of patterns. So, if somebody were to say to me, hey, I left school, university went straight into my first job and I was there for 10 years my brain might go oh oh that's a bit like me I left university and I stayed in my first job for like eight years and then your brain does this really cool little leap and says I think I understand you and that little bit of trust that has gone on there is that basis of that networking effort right it's also the basis of friendship so when you're telling stories that's what you're doing from the very outset Maybe it's not even that personal. Maybe it's, I joined the Navy at 16, and oh, that's okay, my brother's in the military too. Now, that's quite tenuous, but it's still something that your brain goes, oh, here's a thing that's a bit the same. And your brain's constantly trying to do that. Um, and that little bit of trust and that link that you're putting through 
is, uh, is the thing that you need to build on. So, stories we tell about ourselves as individuals. You need to share tiny stories. And that one little bit that I was saying, that one and a half sentences of who you are, is really, really important. But also, so is listening to somebody else's stories. Because somebody else's stories can give you something then to say to them. <gasps> That's a bit like me. I recognize that pattern. Really, really useful. So, perhaps not everybody's an extreme introvert like me. <laughs> so, in the interests of fairness, um, I'm going to tell you my one-sentence story. So, my name is Helen Lazowski, and I use psychology and behavioral science to help companies scale up and to help their staff be the best version of themselves. That's my one-sentence story, and your challenge is, maybe not today, but think about what your one-sentence story would be. And it's a lot harder to write than you imagine, but once you've got it, you can kind of do that, that one thing. So, because when we're telling stories, I happen to go and search for stories that always end happily ever after, because it gives me a nice sense of completion. Um, so, I will always self-select for those. So, they all lived happily ever after, and that is the end of my talk. Has anybody got any questions?